Our next nominee for the Stem Cell Emmy is Gart Kauerberg, who's going to talk to us about making the case for investment in early stage biotech companies, the RxI experience. He's the President Chief Executive Officer of RxI, and I'd like him to come up if he's around. Here he is. I'd like to see what he has to say. I was the guy who used to write the checks. A lot of people have issues uh, getting money when they're in early stage uh, biotech companies. There's a number of reasons for that. And first, maybe to give a little bit of a picture. With, uh, with the current, well, post-recession, re post investors tend to have a totally different view on return on investment. Development timelines, as we know for early projects, are humongously long and sometimes the inventors have died before uh, their product uh, of their invention comes to market. And uh, the attrition rate in early stage products is terrible. There's a lot of failures and there's improvements coming up before the first product even makes it to market. And those are items that have been scaring more and more investors away from putting money to work. So is this a desperate situation? Actually, I don't think so, because the current investment environment is not all that bad. First of all, venture funds have sort of moved away from uh, biotech. There's still uh, biotech venture funds, but uh, the way they work is totally different. They start to resemble more uh, hedge funds and private equity funds. They cross over into public equities. There is today, for the time being, a higher, higher tolerance for risk in private enterprises because of the low interest rates. So what the Fed is doing is actually helping us. People are sitting on piles of cash. They don't know what to do with it. Well, they will put it more easily to, risk, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to play, to work in a higher risk environment because they can't, they can't get any money anywhere else for, the, uh, for their investment. Public players are these days more interested in that early stage, especially for that reason. They are sitting off and hedge funds have been doing well. They're sitting on a pile of cash. They want to make sure that that can continue to uh, bring money in. Of course, it has its consequences, and we'll talk about that. And then there is an IPO window, and not just for IT, but there is an IP IPO window for uh, biotech companies as well. Those are uh, things to keep in the back of your mind. Quickly, RxI, what is that? First of all, we're not into regenerative medicine specifically. We're not into cell therapy. We're not into uh, stem cells. Uh, but we are an oligonucleotide uh, company. Originally, the company was co-founded by Craig Mello, who got this Nobel Prize for discovering RNAs in 2006. Well, he discovered them in 1998, but uh, he got uh, the prize for it in 2006. And uh, uh, shortly after that, it was spun out from Citrix as a pure platform company focusing on uh, delivery technology for RNAs. And in that process, they came up with self-delivering uh, uh, RxRNA, as they call it. Uh, they had no specific therapeutic focus, and that was already an issue because the platform companies had been hot and sexy in the 90s. Hot and sexy in the 90s is not hot and sexy in uh, this uh, new millennium and in this uh, century. Uh, people want products. People want to, see, to participate where the biggest gains are being made. And certainly, the investors want to participate where the biggest gains are being made. Those gains are not being made uh, with licensing out parts of your technology platform to other companies that then may do something with it or mess it up. So uh, no spe uh, specific therapeutic focus was not a good thing. So at a given point in time, they realized they had to do something else. They changed their name from RxI to Galena, and they became a publicly tra they were a publicly traded company as RxII became Galena uh, on Nasdaq, and uh, they uh, changed their focus from RNAi, although they had a very nice platform uh, with a, a nice IP around it, to therapeutic vaccines. Uh, they, had, because some of the other investors in the company were not happy with that decision, they decided to try to spin out their RNAi platform. Uh, in 2011. Just imagine what the issue was with RNAIs. RNAIs are made by the cell, for the cell, and in the cell. If somewhere you need an RNAI from exogenous sources to get in, 
you have to make it outside of the cell for the cell, but you have to try to get into the cell. That is where a lot of our NEI companies failed and the technology has been looked at bit, bit, with big fronts. So the self-delivering technology uh, potentially had something revolutionary there. However, it had, ne it had never been proven in the clinic. Um, the, co the company, uh, Galena, had about 35 employees at the time they decided for the spin-off, and I think the current market cap is about uh, $200 million. So the new RxI emerged, and it, uh, after a while, the Galena had found two hedge fund guys who basically were willing to spin out new RxI uh, and putting in $10 million. Just imagine about it. This is, uh, uh, think about it. This, this is basically putting $10 million in something totally unproven and in an area, RNAIs, where um, a lot of failures had happened. A few good things are happening at the same time as well, but certainly not at that time. And so they took a lot of risk in a very early stage thing. Um, Galena wanted to give a share dividend to its public shareholders, and as a result, and that is a very important lesson to or keep in mind, or at least the possibility to keep in mind if you think about raising money. As a result, um, Galena wanted to give a share dividend, so automatically the spin-out had to become a public entity. But a public entity because of the additional dilution from the two hedge fund managers who wanted to keep control, or not keep control, who wanted to have the bulk of the company because it was their money that was going into a high-risk adventure. Uh, so highly diluted, and it was a penny stock. I think actually that the, at the time of the uh, uh, going public, the price uh, per share was 1.39 pennies. That's peanuts. Um, so uh, we went public in late April of 2012, and uh, our fully diluted market cap, including the preferred shares that the hedge fund uh, guys had, was 12.5 million. Uh, the advantages. When you go public, there's immediate liquidity. So people who like to play the day markets and uh, the guys who know the biotech space a little bit, they say, oh, this is potentially uh, a future success. So they put money in and they ride the ups and the downs of, uh, the, uh, of the stock market. We needed to have focus because I wanted to be sexy in, well, maybe I wanted to be sexy in the 90s, but the sexiness is different in, the, in, in this uh, century. And so we needed to have a product focus. And we picked dermatology for a number of reasons and scarring because dermatology is sort of my background. I've developed quite a few drugs in dermatology. I know I have a good network there. I know the space, but also the area of scarring, abnormal scarring, hypertrophic scars and keloids, keloids is something that is a major need gap. We filed an IND within a month after uh, going public. We started our phase one in July of 2012. I raised another 13, uh, 16.4 million, uh, fortunately also getting a billionaire uh, interested in the company uh, at no discounts, no warrants. Remember, this is an early stage company, so if I can do it, if anybody else with a sexy story that has potential can do it. Uh, and uh, we completed phase one in July of 2013. Very important, stick to your promises. Uh, crystal clear, sharp, focus on what you promise your early investors and don't start to dab away from it and lose your focus. Uh, pester your people to make sure that they stick to their timelines and then uh, you will be successful. We start our phase two actually as we speak and our fu fully diluted market cap a year and a half after going public is $125 million. And I think we're still undervalued significantly. So briefly about the technology. So you know in the oligonucleotide world you have antisense and you have uh, siRNAs, synthetic uh, uh, RNAs. Uh, the advantages of RNAIs, the synthetic ones, is that they're potent and they ha are long-acting. The advantage of antisense is that they penetrate readily into the cells and that they have been proven in terms of PKPD. So there's an advantage there. The disadvantage of the RNA is less active, less selective uh, of the uh, antisense, and the disadvantage of the siRNAs, difficulties getting into the cell. So how do you get to your target? The guys in the previous RxI 
had come up with the self-delivering technology, which ba basically makes a hybrid, which is a single compound. It, you don't have to formulate it for delivery. They build nice IP around it, and uh, we control that space uh, for that kind of structures there that you see uh, on the slide. The advantages are shown, single compound, you don't need a delivery vehicle, you can inject it if you want to. Um, there is robust uptake and silencing proven in a whole slew of different cells and in tissues. Uh, good uh, results in animals as well. So we had uh, to make a selection, we picked connective tissue growth factor because that is core in uh, the wound healing pathway and actually CTGF remains highly upregulated when you're talking about hypertrophic scars and keloids. Um, there was the additional advantage that there was an antisense company, Excalier, that had developed, or that was in development, they had finished phase 2A uh, in hypertrophic scars with an antisense with r remarkable results. So, yes, we had already shown in animals that we were able to silence CTGF in cells, in all cell lines we could silence CTGF, but there was an oligonucleotide that also penetrates well into the cells, like we do, that had shown that there was a clinical validation for the target CTGF. So, we looked in toxicity in, monkey, in monkeys, was very, very well, well tolerated, preclinically de demonstrated uh, 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 down regulation of messenger RNA for CTGF, and we've shown that the protein was uh, present in substantially lower concentrations in animals. Of course, there are no scarring models for animals because animals don't scar. That's why we have to get into phase two clinical trials. Uh, there was a clear development path, Excalier had actually shown what they had to do uh, to get to a point. They were acquired, by the way, with only a single compound, no pipeline. They were, after phase 2A, acquired by Pfizer for $187 million and an earnout. To give you the idea that, yes, early stage investors can make money if they pick and choose the right uh, uh, companies. A normal scar, when you go to a surgeon, uh, what you see, that is what it should be, and gradually it should fade. Hypertrophic scar is within the uh, area where the incision has happened, but uh, because CTGF remains upregulated, it becomes uh, basically an elevated scar, and then a keloid is worse even. A keloid, uh, high CTGF levels continue, and the keloid grows outside of the boundary of the scars. Uh, keloids, when you remove them surgically, they come back in 95% of the cases. And hypertrophic scars have a 70% recurrence rate. They come back, and once they come back the first time, they will come back a second time. A little bit about the Excalier thing. That is the, some data that were shown with the Excalier compound that comes from a, a, a Pfizer poster on, uh, on the product. You can see when you take patients with, for instance, bilateral scars, breast augmentation or best breast reduction, you, t you treat one scar with active, one scar with placebo. Of course, your IRB will tell you that you, if it works, also have to treat the placebo-treated scar afterwards with active. Uh, then you can nicely show a difference, as they have done. Or you can take lower abdominal uh, the hypertrophic scars, remove the scar, treat part of the scar with active, part with placebo, and in the same patient you can see the difference uh, in uh, results. So those clinical data, not data with uh, RxI109, but with another oligonucleotide, with an antisense oligonucleotide with the same target, suggests that there could be some clinical validation here. Where are we with uh, RxI109? We've finished our phase one. In phase one, a single injection, our first phase one study, a single injection, uh, five different small cohorts, three patients each, but four incisions we made. These were uh, women who had uh, a desire to undergo an abdominoplasty, and uh, we were happy to pay for it if we were able to use the tissue uh, for testing. And uh, if you can see here that, uh, what happened to the protein three months, 84 days after a single injection. And so each, each patient was her own control. There were uh, active treated scars, incisions and placebo treated incisions. And so what you see is the percentages as compared to the internal control that was the patient itself. So with a single injection, almost three months later, we had significant reduction in the protein CTGF uh, uh, in cohorts, uh, in the two highest cohorts. In a second study, multidose, we treated the patients also with a number of in uh, incisions. 
And uh, again, but now we looked a few days after injecting at messenger RNA. And except for patient two in the first cohort, everybody had lower messenger RNA levels in the active treated sites. And if you look at the cohorts specifically, if you take cohorts two and three, which uh, are the core three and four uh, in terms of those of the first study, we actually end up with a statistical reduction of the messenger RNA by almost 50%. So th that was just quickly about the story and why I think those investors got all excited about it, because we had uh, the messenger RNA data, we have a platform that actually can be used in a bunch of other diseases as well. We only focus on connective tissue growth factor, but we are talking to ophthalmology companies for uses in ophthalmology. We could even use what we have with our technology platform to create a new spin-out in ophthalmology because we have three targets in our pipeline for ophthalmological indications and gen use that to generate money and use that to get more usage of uh, self-delivering technology in the space. There are public uh, investors and venture funds who are interested in investing in such a spin-out. So once you have a successful platform, don't try to do everything yourself. Use your platform to have others uh, work for you and uh, build the value of your pa platform that way. So early investors need a well-defined space with a sexy story. Uh, it needs to be technologically advanced, but you should still be able to translate it to the point that relatively lay persons can understand it. You need a strong and coherent management team. Not a big one, a strong one. Uh, the platform ideally controlled, but you pick the products that you want to work with and uh, don't uh, have a bad feeling giving parts of your baby or some of your children away uh, to, to other people who can also benefit from it. Public company has some degree of liquidity. And actually, I noticed a few days ago in the Wall Street Journal that there is now that the SEC uh, now allows to go public without going through that whole hoopla of an IPO. There's, uh, you can, uh, I'm sure, find that uh, on the SEC website. Um, there is an exit potential for with a significant value gain in a few years. Uh, if you think about our fully diluted market cap a year and a half ago, uh, 12 and a half million today, 125. 120, 125 million, that is not insignificant in uh, a year and a half time. And uh, executional speed, uh, sticking to your promises, is extremely important when you're an early stage company. And then what you should keep in mind when you get in bed with uh, hedge fund managers, they don't like control necessarily. Uh, my hedge fund guys are not on the board. They refuse to be on the board. They only have voting rights for very specific things, dilutive events and change in control. For everything else, I don't even talk to them. Uh, however, when you started your company and you created it, they will ask for the majority of it. So in the case you take a technology platform that is uh, treated as an orphan in an existing drug, in a, a drug company, it's fine because you don't have to put your intellectual uh, creativity to work and work hard to get it to that certain stage. If you have started it yourself and worked two, three years to get to a certain point that it becomes sexy, they will ask for the majority of uh, the company. You will end up still having 20, 25%, but that is way less than the 100% you used to own. Of course, now you have 10 or $20 million in the bank you can work with, at least. Before that, you could only dream about it. Uh, hedge funds and venture funds are totally different. Hedge funds are science-driven, yes, but they are, in the first place, return on investment-driven. And they will do things that you would not necessarily hold for uh, possible. I've seen hedge fund people short their own companies. It's not because they don't believe in the company, it's because they want to take some chips off the table, as they say it. And that is then, they short it, making money uh, at a certain price, and then they buy it back at a lower price. And the difference is money they put back in their hedge fund. You don't like it if that happens, but it does happen. Early exits are possible. So if you are dreaming uh, about starting a company and saying, ha ha, I made it, and uh, th this is my uh, job for life, no, because once there's control over that part, 
then they control change and control. An early exit is possible. Focus on timelines and milestones, as I already mentioned. Public company is uh, great, but the price is volatile. We, went, we were as low as uh, 1.39 cents. We were as high at, as 35 cents. Uh, after, and then we did a reverse split. Uh, cash management is critical. No room for error there. Focus on the deliverables. Don't start to play in adjacent fields. Uh, try to expand the shareholder base because shareholder structure, balancing preferred and common, is a major issue. As a CEO, you have to be aware of that. So having some experience with public markets, not a bad thing. And then the last thing, be prepared for a, for a roller coaster, which is fun for some people, others don't like it. Uh, there's never a dull moment. And, and every, every time we get a challenge, we talk about a learning opportunity, not a challenge. That's it. Thank you.